For longtime TVO viewers, Tom Ernst is a familiar face as the host and producer of Saturday Night at the Movies. And while he continues to be an astute film writer and critic, the book he's just written doesn't have much to do with the silver screen. It's a memoir and more harrowing and unfathomable than many an Oscar-winning film. It's called The Wild Boy of Wabamick and chronicles the sexual abuse Tom suffered at the hands of his adoptive father. And we welcome back to TVO, Tom Ernst. Thank you, Steve. It's great to see you here again. I have to tell you, I mean, right off the top, and you and I, we saw each other the other day mm -hmm. at something, and I, I mean, I've known you 20 years. I had not a clue this was your life. How often do you get that from people? Well, I have been quite open about it with a, a lot of close friends and uh, uh, actually family, not so much. So I get it more from family uh, than friends. But it, obviously it's not the kind of topic you just bring up casually. But once you do get to the point where you can talk about it, and it takes quite a while to reach that point, sometimes it's hard to shut you up shut me up uh, uh, talking about it. So I'm, I'm quite surprised I didn't corner you with this at one point. I am too. I'm, I'm sorry, like we're, we're pals. I, yes, I we are. We've, you know, gone to movies and hung out and, and I, I never knew any of this. And I'm, I gotta tell you, I'm so glad you wrote the book. Besides the fact that you tell a compelling and dramatic story, you're a great writer. It's Thank you so much. It's extremely well written. And well. Anyway, enough of that. I, I'd like if, if we could start, we have picked out a passage for you to read. And because you're about to turn 65, you need those glasses. <laughs> so put your glasses on and let's hear you read an excerpt from The Wild Boy of Wabamick. Happy Over to, to you. you. And by the way, it's never enough for that. You can keep going on about that <laughs> as long as you want. Okay. But something happened during the summer. Something to make my parents pack up and leave their precious rural life, move into the city, which they said would never happen, and immerse themselves in a new devotion to Christ by joining a church that demanded every word in the Bible be taken literally. All these changes in the two months I was away, and except for the boxes of photographs and dusty memorabilia, everything was unpacked and in place by the time I got home. So something happened, but no one was talking. It didn't strike me as strange at the time. If it had, then maybe I'd have done some investigating asked a few questions, gone back to the neighborhood to find out what set this sudden change of events into motion. But how could I possibly see anything strange? How could a boy, now a young man, whose sex life began at the hands of his father long before he reached puberty and continued well through his teens, how could that boy determine what was strange? How could anything seem unnatural, irregular, mysterious, out of sorts, not quite right, bizarre, peculiar, questionable, when the most unnatural, unbelievable atrocity had become part of my norm. No, that boy, me, would not think such a dramatic change of lifestyle and beliefs unusual at all. Like everything else, things were just the way they were. I now lived in the city. My parents no longer drank or danced or read unless it was the Bible. And the most important change of all, we now owned a colored television. <laughs> okay, there's so much to unpack there. But I mean, as people may have been able to see when you read that passage, that's about three quarters of the way through the book. And you're a teenager at this point, mm -hmm. and it, it establishes a couple of things. Number one, your life is pretty messed up at this point as a result of what your father did. And yet number two, you have the wherewithal to tell a funny joke at the end of this passage, which really describes some terrible things. So let's start there. How do you find the humor in any of what you went through? I don't think I had to find it. You know, in, in life, regardless of what we're going through, and we see this in, in third world countries and people who have uh, suffered atrocities, that uh, life still offers little gems. Um, now, obviously, I've, I've lived, dis despite this past, I've lived a rather charmed life in many ways. Um, I had wonderful uh, children. children. I, I do have a wonderful child, but I had wonderful sisters, wonderful friends, uh, cousins, and they all contributed to a joy because they didn't know what was going on. So I was able to separate and categorize what was happening to me and uh, just relish in the joy of, of what was going on around me. I mentioned my friend Doug quite a bit in that book. And if you have a friend like Doug, 
funny things just come naturally. Because? Tell He's us about Doug. He's a funny guy. <laughs> I mean, Doug is the... <laughs> Doug is the kind of guy who would build a raft uh, and go out in the middle of a, a, a pond in our farm only to have the raft separate while he was in <laughs> midwater. And he would do things like that quite, mm. quite consistently. So, uh, you know, unbeknownst to himself, uh, you know, he was a very funny guy. And I, I got a lot of joy from hanging out with him, his family, and again, I say my sisters, who are considerably older, uh, and uh, would, you know, welcome me into uh, their homes. They had children, my nephews and nieces who, by the way, are the first to step up when this story came out, my nephews and nieces, to show their support. So there let's, was a lot of reasons to be happy. Let's go back. How old were you when you were adopted? I was three, to, about to turn four. And did you, at what point, find out from your adoptive parents that they were not your birth parents, but in fact, you were relatively new to the family. I think I had a sense of that because uh, I, I left my parents, or was taken from my parents uh, by the children's aid, was in a orphanage for a very short while. This isn't in the book, I don't think it is anyway, um, where uh, in the orphanage, there I do remember kids everywhere and toys everywhere. And I thought, this is where I wanna be. So then I was removed from that into a foster home, removed the foster home, into my, into my uh, parents, my adopted parents' home. So by that time, I just figured this was the norm. You know, you just sort of bounced around until you settled into one family. And when I found out that I wasn't going to go back to my foster home, which I adored, uh, or move to a different home, uh, I was physically ill. The idea of staying in one place just was not something I was aware of or, or knew could be done. And how much of your birth parents and that life with them in the first few years did you remember after your adoption? I remember none of it, but what happened was is I met them. And uh, so they filled in the blanks, a lot of blanks for me, as much as they could. How old were you when you met? I mean, that was later in life. Yeah, I was 19 yeah. when I met them. Um, and they filled in a lot of blanks for me uh, and gave me stories that became my own stories. Uh, and as I also had, in one, in one moment, I remember a nightmare I had as a child, a recurring nightmare of which this little girl was kidnapped in front of me and someone coming out and saying, you were supposed to look after her. This was, to me, a recurring nightmare until I met my birth mother, who tells me this story about how I'm playing out in front and the children's aide or someone comes along and picks her up, my sister, who I end up meeting later in life as well. How old were you when the abuse at the hands of your father started? I don't really recall. I've been going by the age of eight because that's how I could sort of mathematically figure things out, what was going on in the world and what was going on uh, with me. Uh, so it could have happened anywhere between uh, eight and 11 where it started. I def there are some events I definitely know that it was going on and one of them was the moon landing. So that is one way, and I was 11 at that time. Mm. So that was one way I could sort of chart this. And I knew it happened a few years before that. So uh, I came up with the number eight. At what point did you realize that what was going on with your father was not good? Right away, right away from the moment he began. And incidentally, in calling him my father is absolutely accurate, but I have a, re a reluctance to do that. I, I, mm. I tend to tell people I grew up without a father. Uh, it's not true, but it's, it's, it's just how I feel. I think a father is something you earn. And uh, you're a father. I'm a father. So uh, I refer to him as Claire. Uh, and m I might have even referred to him as the father in the book, but it's something I'm reluctant to do. Um, so to answer your question, I knew it was wrong right away. I knew it was wrong because it felt like playground stuff that you just don't do or let grown-ups know, like, you know, whatever you do at that age. Um, it felt like a dirty joke that I didn't want to hear. Uh, and the idea that we had to keep this secret just was the final nail that went, this isn't right. Yet at the same time, he was representing my father. He was in that role. And so that was confusing because how could a father do something that shouldn't be done? That's, I mean, one of the many ultimate questions you have to ask during the course of your life and in your book. How does a father whose job it is to protect his family mm -hmm. end up doing this to one of his children? Did you ever come to a satisfactory conclusion on that question? 
No, and the opportunity to do that may have been there, but I was young too when I was coming to terms with this and wasn't willing to let him off the hook. Mm. Uh, there is a moment when he does make an appeal uh, and does admit that he wasn't, as he says, not much of a father. That comes later, though. It comes much later. And um, I, wasn't, I wasn't ready for that. Mm -hmm. I, did, I, did, I was pretending, I used to pray every day, back in the days when I would do that, um, that no one ever found out. I lived in absolute fear that that kid would one day write a book. <laughs> And yet you told somebody. You, you eventually one day at a restaurant sat down and blurted it out. To my sister. To your sister. Who is one of the most caring, loving mm -hmm. women I, I know. And I feel like if it wasn't for her and her husband, I would be in a much worse place. How old were you when you did that? Told my sister? Yeah. 19. Why did you do it? You'd kept a secret for more than a decade. God knows. Uh, you know what? I don't know what, what motivates me sometimes to do these things. I wasn't in a place that I was telling people. Um, I guess there was just some warmth and connection between my sister and I, something that really made me want to let her know. Um, and I think I underestimated the power of what I was saying hmm. uh, and, and the shock that it sort of it, it hit her with. But... Um, I did, and I'm glad she's the first person I told. Tom, your father abused you over and over and over. This was not a, you know, a, a rare occurrence. This happened a lot. Yes. How the hell did you get through it? Um, you know, there's a, there's a portion of the book that I didn't put in, uh, and it took place, uh, and I think this sort of sums it up. It took place during the moon landing afterwards, the moon landing, where I began to fantasize that I was an astronaut. And I would do this, I would go into this movie world uh, and I would create these stories in my head um, until, you know, until I was set free and allowed to go. Uh, so quite frequently, I would just uh, disappear into uh, uh, some kind of uh, my own little movie screen. And that, that's, I think, helped me get through it. Do you think your mother ever knew? I believe my mother knew, but I don't know if my mother knew. Uh, and that is a big question. And by the end of her life, uh, she, she died at uh, age 97. Uh, we had a few exchanges, um, not, very few of them pleasant. Uh, she was in denial, of course. Uh, she blamed me at another point, and uh, she was more concerned about what this meant about her husband's sexuality rather than what it meant about what it did to her son. But at the end, she seemed to have forgotten about it. And she, she used this phrase a lot, we're so glad we adopted you. And I really, as much as I love my sisters, and I do care for my mother, my late mother, I really wanted her to say, I'm so sorry we adopted you. Do you think there was a part of your father which seeing you as an adopted son, as opposed to a, I don't know. A uh, yeah, birth son? Birth yes. son. Do you think that gave him some twisted notion that what he was doing was not as bad as it was. It gave me that twisted notion. Uh, and be, uh, but as I was later to find, not to give any spoilers, um, but uh, I wasn't the only one in the family. Well, you just... I gave a spoiler. That's a spoiler but, alert. But it, you know yeah. what? It's not yeah. really... I mean, the, the whole spoiler, I'm here uh, alive. I'm here talking yes. to you. That's the end of the story, so... You're... you're I mean, one of the themes that persists in the book is this notion that I've really got to confront my dad with this someday. We mm -hmm. really got to have it out over that. Yeah. Do you feel you ever really got that moment? Did not. And as I said, he tried. Mm -hmm. I wasn't ready for it. Uh, I don't feel the loss. I, he, I don't feel it. He, he died, mm -hmm. and you almost didn't go to his funeral. You didn't want to go to the funeral. Eh? I did not. My dad ended up in a, a home. He got, had Alzheimer's. And as from what I understand from what my sisters and brother-in-laws tell me, he, he lived a very happy life with Alzheimer's. He thought he was a doctor, <laughs> and he wandered around with a clipboard, so I hear. And he would also take a toy rake and rake the leaves outside. Uh, and this is how his life ended. And um, I think there was a little resentment on my part <laughs> that he got off the hook. But I have to accept the fact that 
He got off the hook because I let him. And there were moments when I tried to connect with him, when his sisters died and stuff like that. But he developed a new kind of cruelty, uh, which is in the book and which I won't give away, mm. um, that uh, made it hard to want to connect with him. Do you think your dad was evil? That's a very good question. I think my dad was haunted. I think my dad, uh, I think everybody deserves compassion. Uh, and I don't think anybody is one thing. So evil is a very difficult word to label somebody with. I think what he did was evil. I think he was insensitive. I think he was uh, more concerned about his own needs than anyone else's. Um, I think my dad had mental health issues. Well, I was going to say, he clearly had an illness that he was unable to seek treatment for or get control of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether that gives you, like, I don't know, does that give you some... Cover's not the right word. What's the word I'm looking for here? Closure, maybe? No. I mean, d does it give you some empathy into the fact that that he's he may be an evil guy, but he's also just a sick guy? Mm. Empathy is also an interesting word. I, I, and I've been get, hearing this a lot, uh, particularly from my family, that there's an expectation for me to be empathetic. Mm -hmm. And there's an expectation to forgive. Uh, and I understand the value of forgiveness. I, I don't see it, incidentally. I, I, I have no expectation that you should be empathetic to his problems okay. or should forgive him for the awful stuff that he did. I don't, I, don't, I don't think there's any expectation on you that you have to provide that to him. I don't feel that either. Right, okay. <laughs> but I, I do get, there are certain people, particularly professionals, and, uh, mm -hmm. who, who talk about the power of, of, of acceptance and the power of forgiveness. And I understand that that can be a very powerful thing. Um, I know for a fact if my father was still alive, he would not have access to my daughter. And uh, I know that there's one sister in my family whose children did not have access to my father. I think that must have been hard for him. I think that must have, been, that must have haunted him. And I do believe that my dad, in the, in the quiet moments of his mind and, and, and of his room or wherever he went to, that it was hell for him. It had to be. How mm. can you do this and not go, what a terrible, terrible thing I've done? It didn't stop him from doing it again, mm. but I, I think he must have had his own personal hell. For that, maybe I'm empathetic, uh, but not, not in the long run. I'm still working on the forgiveness part. Well, this is what I wonder. How much of you, how much of your guts inside are still in knots over all of the unresolved issues of this? The unresolved issues, I think, were able to be taken care of in the book. Um, the unresolved issues are in conversations with my wife. And the unresolved issues really show themselves when I'm capable of loving my daughter. Mm. And uh, capable of loving my daughter without causing her harm, uh, yeah, other than the harm we do without even knowing. Um, but. These are where my unresolved issues come out and, and are taken care of. I infer from that that writing this book was hugely cathartic for you. Never wanted it to be. Never expected it to be. I wanted to write a good story. I didn't want to write a poor me story. I didn't want to write a movie of the week, although, Steve, it would make a great movie of the week. It would, actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I wanted to write a book that uh, it's hard to, to understand this, but is entertaining. Yeah, in a way. I wanted to be humorous. I wanted to be uh, uh, honest. Um, and I think because of uh, a Dunder and Press, little shout out to them, who were brave enough to take on this book, um, and uh, my uh, editor, uh, Russell Smith, uh, who, I'm, who was with the Globe and Mail for years, they were able to take what I wrote, which was probably very hard to read, into something quite readable. Were there members of your family that wanted you not to write this book? There are members of there my family. There are members. Yes. How have you resolved that? Uh, so far, I've tried to reach out to them and, and speak to them about it. They're, they, they, they're not wrong. They're not wrong. They, too, were victims. Uh, and they chose to not be loud about the, the victimization. Mm -hmm. And that's their choice. And I thought for a moment, I'm telling their story, but I'm not. I'm telling my story. It's unfortunate that they happen to be in it. Mm -hmm. um, I think 
if I may just go on, I think there is a certain amount of belief that keeping quiet, keeping these stories to yourself, keeping the secret, that that's the bravery, that's the courage. And it's hard to live with those things. Uh, I don't think it's courageous to talk talk about it. I don't think it's courageous to write the book. I don't think I've done any brave act. What I've done was I've simply done what I had to do to make sure that I have settled with myself on, on this incident. And, and um, I think voices need to be heard. I think that's a given. Um, some people will choose not to, and, and that is their choice. But we can't be afraid to talk about sexual trauma, childhood abuse. The ramifications of it last a lifetime. Well, this is one of the services I think you've done in writing the book, is that this starts innocently enough, right? Like your dad's playing tickle games with you at the beginning, mm -hmm. and it goes beyond that. And anybody who's reading this book who recognizes that pattern of behavior is going to have an education on what to look out for. To that end, at the very least, you've done a service. Thank you. So there you go. I think that's worth putting on the record. Education, I think, is essential. Exactly. And, yeah. and a lot of people misunderstand the abuse and, and misunderstand speaking about it as, as being, um, you know, almost uh, 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 not ungrateful. But there is, certain there is certain feelings among some of my family members that I am being ungrateful. Um, but it's essential. Education is essential. Um, that's why we have TVO, right? <laughs> I know we don't get a do-over in life, but if you had a do-over, would you have wished never to have been adopted by that family? Um, if I had a do-over, I, I would speak out. I would speak out the moment it happened. I would not be afraid to go to my neighbors, who, um, who I adored and spent a lot of time there, by the way, and say, hide me. I would not have any problem going to my sister who had me over a lot, a lot of times to play with her kids and stuff and say, raise me. Hmm. That's what I would do. I, I, I love my family uh, and I love the friends that I've made. And I have to assume that all the little steps I took in life is what brought me to TVO, what brings me here. Uh, and I wouldn't have wanted to miss out on any of that. How old is your daughter? She's 16. How much of this story did she know? She just knows that something about her grandfather wasn't right and that we don't talk about him in any sort of praise. Uh, and she, uh, she hasn't read the book yet. She said she's not ready to, and I appreciate that. She said she might read the last chapter because she knows that's about her, but I don't know if she has yet. Hmm. That copy of the book on the desk here, how different is that what draft number is that compared to what you started with? Twelve. That's your twelfth draft. Yeah, and when we say draft, it's not just spelling corrections and adding a paragraph. It's tossing the whole thing out and starting again. How come? Because I, I think you know this from writing, is that uh, unless you're far better at it than I am, um, when you write, you write down all your thoughts. You just get everything out. So a lot of it was unreadable. A lot of it was terrifying, I think. Uh, and uh, and uh, so you have to throw it out and, and start again. And the, and the words that stay with you are the words that come into the second draft. And then you throw it out again, and then the third draft, fourth draft. So I'm writing a, another book, a second book, and uh, everything I write, I go, why bother? I'm going to throw it out anyway. So <laughs> it's, it's just the process. And I, I've, I've learned to love the process when you see the finished product. Because this, what is on the table here right now, is a far better book than even draft 11. Huh, okay, cool. Uh, just finally, you know, it, it would have been completely understandable for you to have been overwhelmed by what you went through and as a result, led a miserable life. Given that I know you as I do, you're one of the happiest guys I know. <laughs> yeah. You see, you've found, I mean, you've found this great passion of, of being a film critic of motion pictures and, of course, hosting Saturday Night at the Movies for all those years. D do you understand yet why you were not subsumed in the misery of what you grew up with? It's why I found my birth parents. 
because I think there is something there in even though they didn't have a, a great life from what I could gather, but um, there's something inherently positive about them. And I think, well, I used the word inherently, so maybe I just inherited it. Mm -hmm. I do have privileges, obviously. I, I was, you know, given food and a house and, and all these other things, which is confusing, yet at the same time rewarding. But um, I, I wasn't always easy to get along with, and I had to work at that. And I got, I got help when I could, when I was of an age to seek it out for myself. That certainly did wonders. Um, and uh, I have a really strong support group, uh, people I work with, yourself, and uh, the people I was raised with. I would say your wife's one of the heroes of the story. She is absolutely she a hero. She sounds amazing. She is yeah. amazing. You've met her. <laughs> I've you met her, but is. I don't know her as well as I know you, but, <laughs> but she sounds like one of the heroes of this piece. Well, I'm glad I got to read draft 12. It's excellent. <laughs> Thank you. The Wild Boy of Wabamick, a memoir. Tom Ernst. Great to see you again, Tom. It's great to see, see you. Thank you for this. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.